Grab a seat, and we'll get started. This is Nathan. He's going to start worship for us. Good morning, guys. Uh, please prepare your hearts for worship, and please turn off your phones and close other tabs and apps. And even at the comfort of your home, please rise if possible for a reference for God. Romans 15, 1 through 2. Uh, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with failings of the weak and not to please ourselves let each of us please his neighbor for his God to build him up. Oh. Okay. Uh, dear God, thank you for this day, and let us uh, let us focus in PD's uh, sermon, and let us not fall asleep during PD's sermon, and let us all focus during the sermon and let us have a great day In jesus name we pray amen uh let us rise for worship
All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, you're good, you're holy. We praise you for all the things that you have done in our lives and the things you will do in the future. Grant us strength to fight the good fight every single day. You've been giving us the opportunity to serve you. Help us to see and seize that opportunity to not only love our brothers and sisters in Christ, but also to expand your kingdom to the ends of the world. I pray for this, I pray for this community, Father. Grow them and mature them more and more like you every day. I pray that you could give them wisdom and perseverance. Help them to have God-centeredness in their lives. Let them fix their lives onto you and you alone, the only hope in this world. Grant us desperateness to cling onto you more every day and let go of worldly things we tend to hold on to. Continue to protect them and bless them. Pour out extra portion of grace to these students for them to see you more clearly. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, where his grave he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. First Timothy 5, 17 to 25. But the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treats on out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and the elect angels, I charge you to keep those rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in delaying on of hands, or take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink uh, only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent almonds. The sins of some people are conspicuous, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works, works are conspicuous, even those that are cannot remain hidden. How's everybody? Doing well? Good. Good. Anybody had a rough week? Yeah, some of us. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Okay. Well, the, the rest of us seem like they had an okay week. All right. So we're actually still in the series of First Timothy, and we're moving right along. And as we see at the end of this chapter, we're actually just continuing from the previous message from last week. And if you don't know what that was, um, you can talk to anybody who was here, and we can talk about that. Um, 
but yeah. And uh, today we're going to go into the second half of that, covering both uh, the elderships, right? So those who are older than us, first the widows and then now the elders. Uh, so more like women, now men. Um, but it's kind of more detailed than that. And it kind of shows us how Christians ought to live, how we should live our daily lives, and how we should improve our faith to the point of maturity. And that's what we're going to cover, Christian maturity today. So let's pray together before we dive in. O oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, you are our God, you are our Savior, you are the Alpha and the Omega. And this is your word. <coughs> Excuse me. Then this is your word. This is uh, your word for your people. So grant us your understanding to understand the way you want us to understand you. Uh, let it not be about us putting ourselves into your word but the other way, that let your word come into us, transform us, uh, cut through our sinful natures and sinful thoughts and attitudes and cut away those things that's unnecessary so that only your word will remain and, and grow into maturity and fruition uh, for your honor and your glory. We ask, O oh Lord, that this will not profit just uh, any one of us, but as the church, as the body of Christ. Let your word do uh, the good and the beautiful and the wonderful things that it was designed to do. So reveal yourself through the word. Reveal yourself now, O Lord, in the presence through the Holy Spirit. And remind us and convict us of um, ourselves, uh, of our sinful nature, so that we may rely all the more on our Savior, Jesus. Thank you for the, the good news that we are not alone and that we have people of example and a great cloud of witnesses uh, to help us along the way in this difficult journey of faith and living in the world. So, Lord, act upon your word. Live through us so that it's not just uh, good words into our hearts and ears. So open our eyes and our hearts in such a way that we receive and be able to duplicate or, or to improve upon your kingdom, Lord. So thank you, Lord. And as I speak... Speak through me, Lord. Let it be not about me at all, but about you. Help us to focus on our Savior, Jesus, and to have the right attitude toward worship. And we thank you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, how should Christians act according to God's word? And the first thing we kind of looked at was, well, we need to understand God's word before we move on and then look at, you know, what it says, right? We need to understand... Um, God, and so we have a better relationship with him, so we have a better understanding of ourselves and where our sin nature and, like, why we do the things that we do when we shouldn't, right? So when we get mad, why do we act out in such a rage, Hulk-like manner when we could take it in a more mature way, right? And why do we pursue things we know aren't really good for us um, instead, why, you know, instead of doing something that is actually beneficial, so when we have that relationship with God and we build that relationship, so loving the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind, and then building that relationship with one another, right? The horizontal relation, uh, the vertical relationship first, and then building the horizontal, which kind of symbolizes the cross as itself, right? And as we help our families in, in a respectful, honoring, glorifying way, we also like build the church up that way. And once we do this, we don't burden the church with weight and unnecessary things, and not look to ourselves, right? So we don't come to church saying, well, I'll do this so that I can get benefit later. It's in fact the opposite. And this is what makes the church so difficult because a lot of people come to church looking for help. And we want to help everybody. And then when we do that, we feel like, what about me? Why, why is no one helping me? Why is no one helping my family? And we looked at that last week, right? Because many of your parents are already serving at the church in such a way, they get kind of burnt out. They get tired. They get stressed at home. And you're wondering, like, well, that doesn't look like the church. That doesn't sound like what the body of Christ, that doesn't look like what the Bible says. But in fact, it's, it's true. Because church is made up of sinful, broken people. And where's Christ in all of that, right? So once we understand our vertical relationship with Christ, it starts to influence Christianity in a, in a way that it's meant to be. So when we follow the word, we love God, we love one another, we get to this place where we can actually do some good, 
We can actually grow in our maturity and spiritual understanding and not burden the church in such a way where, you know, in verse uh, 1 and 2, it says, do not rebuke the older man, but encourage him as you would a father, right? Having that deep, loving understanding and relationship where you see older people with respect, right? We talked about the younger students here with the older students and elementary and, and those kids looking up to you guys as an example. Younger men as brothers, young, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity, right? Today we get to see what Paul says to Timothy about elders, more specifically about elders, but we're looking at it in terms of, well, what kind of Christians we should be? Like, how do we become the kind of people that Paul is mentioning here? So verse 17, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. That's verse 1 and 2. Uh, the, the elder, the word that's being used here is the same word that's being used in Acts 20, 28. Next verse. Yeah. Uh, pay careful attention to yourselves and to the, all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. This is Jesus talking about the body of Christ, the church, and how he instituted. He loves the church so much. As a, a husband to a wife, right, Jesus to the church, he gave himself up for it. And this overseer is the same word used for elder here. And so this was uh, first established during that time, right? So the reason why the elders, in this case, uh, the overseers were instituted, uh, appointed by the apostles, was because the apostles had specific duties. They have to go out and do certain things, and they weren't able to manage everything around them because people were so hungry for the word. They would come in, and they were so hungry for the word that <clears throat> they needed people to teach and preach while the apostles were also out planting churches and laying hands on people and praying over them and healing the sick, and, and all this was happening, and so they needed people to help. So they saw people of the church, saw people who were gifted and were eager and hungry and excited to serve the church. And they, they laid hands on them, prayed for this person, anointed this person to be an overseer, to look over everybody else. So uh, this kind of overseeing is like a shepherd overseeing a flock, right? They're just as much in authority and power and responsibility as the apostles, and today, we have that in our church. We call them pastors and elders and deacons, right? And in Korean churches, kwonsa means, right? Um, the word kwonsa doesn't show up in the Bible because it's a Korean word, but you get the idea. When we get into uh, this passage, we get kind of like, yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with me, right? Same with the widows. Like, I'm not a widow, I don't need this information. Uh, I'm not an elder, I don't need this information. So this is the kind of the attitude that I see in, in the generations of, uh, of students. It was the same attitude when I was in school as the generation after me and so on and for you guys. You guys sit in class and think, like, I don't need this. Who needs calculus and algebra? It's not in the real world, and I don't need geometry and whatever, right? But that's... That's not true, right? Uh, just because you don't need it now doesn't mean you won't need it later. Just because you're not an elder now doesn't mean you won't become a pastor later. Hmm? Some of you? Yes? Yes? No? No, no call? No taking? No? Okay. We learn a lot, actually, about Christian maturity here, like what the church should do in terms of how to provide for the church and church uh, people who oversee. Doing the double honor is what we're going to look at. So go back a, a slide, please. Yeah. Uh, it says the elders who rule will be considered worthy of double honor. This elder is doing two things, uh, preaching and teaching, especially those who labor, work. This, work. this labor is like toiling, like sweating, blood, sweat, and tears kind of work, right? 
And the people who are doing this, preaching and teaching, laying hands on people and praying over them and taking care of the, the church, should be given double honor, honor on earth as it is in heaven. So giving the people who serve God's kingdom the respect and that they deserve. So this is where it gets kind of difficult for me to preach because it sounds like it's self-serving. And if you're new and visiting us, it may sound like, oh, this is just like the, any other church. This is one of those online churches and sort of thing where they want money and my, my time and they want me to invest in a jumbo airplane for this church or whatever. Like, that's not us. So I want to kind of give you a disclaimer. Just because I'm preaching this doesn't mean I want this. It's in the word. So I'm preaching the word, right? Does that make sense? This isn't for my benefit, right? So this is where it gets kind of confusing and kind of tricky. The double honor here is like if you went to In-N-Out and you wanted a single and they gave you a double for free. No? You don't like double doubles? What? All right. So the, the preaching and teaching, the person who deserves a double honor is somebody who's doing the work, but doing it well. This work isn't just doing the work for the sake of doing work, but doing the work well. You guys have projects and doing assignments. You can just do it and get it done and turn it in. But you could do it really well and turn it in and get extra benefits. Do you know what I mean? You get that extra bonus? No? Okay. Tough crowd today. Sorry. Doing the, well, uh, doing the work well, preaching and teaching, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. Two slides up. That's not it. No? I'll read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. <clears throat> but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though, I was not, uh, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. And this is Paul talking, that he's saying when he worked for the church, for Christ, he worked harder than anybody else, or at least in his sight. He worked really hard. Not because he was good at what he was doing, but because it was the grace of God in him. And when we see people like this, we see that they are working hard, but they're not doing it for the payment. They're doing it because they love Christ and because of the grace of God. So a lot of you guys are uh, tested, right? Tested at school, exams, quizzes, so on. You pass those tests because you study on it. And that's, that's like, it feels like that comes first. And then later on, you feel like you, once you pass, you can live, right? So once you finish high school, middle school, you go to high school. High school, you finish and you go to college. After college, you finish those exams, you finish those things, and you get a degree and you finish it and you move on with your life, right? Then you start the work, right? You see the process? But the Bible is the opposite. You do the work first, then you'll be paid later. You do the work, then you will be tested later. You'll be judged according to your work after the fact. This isn't the kind of work where you get to finish and you get accredited and you're a pastor now or an elder and now you can do the work well. You have to do the work well first so that when you stand before Christ, when he judges you, he can say, well done, my good and faithful servant. The judgment of the work comes after the fact. The testing, the examination of that. So when we see all of this and we put it together, what does the pastor do anyway? Does he just preach and teach on Sunday and once a week or twice a week on the weekdays and that's it? Like, why do they need to be paid at all, right? Um, a lot of you guys may not even know that I'm paid by the church, uh, but I am. So, so is a lot of pastors uh, at the church be it part-time or full-time. I'm a full-time pastor, meaning this is my life. This is all I do. And you may be wondering, what does PV do during the week? Other than playing games with you, what do I do? 
what do I do? Yes, I, I read the Bible. Yes, I pray um, a lot, I think. Not more than I should or anything like that. I should probably pray more than I should and read more than I should. Um, I also read a lot during the week and will watch sermons and seminars and lectures and things like this online. And I, I take classes here and there. What is that all for, though? Is that for my own benefit and my own good? And no, I, it, it's so that I'm better prepared so that I can do the work better. What is the work I do? Well, to oversee the, the flock. Do I do that well? Well, the judgment isn't really based on the flock, right? It's not the sheep that baa at the shepherd and be like, I don't like this grass, like take me to my, somewhere else. It's really the judgment and the test is, is coming by the Lord later. And I have to be prepared for that. It says here in Deuteronomy 25, verse 4, you shall not muzzle an ox when it is treading out the grain. It's the same passage that's being quoted in this, uh, verse, uh, in this passage that we're looking at. So Deuteronomy 25, 4 is being quoted by Paul here. Why is he saying this? Is this because God is so concerned with bulls and oxen? Yes. And also to show that people who work for him also need to be treated well. So back in the day, um, they would tie these oxen or animals of burden, right? Bulls, oxen, cows, donkeys, and other animals. They would uh, tie them up, and back then, before like the mills and stuff, uh, what they would do is pour out the grain on the ground and let the bull r go around in circles until all the grain was like crushed and all the delicious part was left. Right? And, th and then the farmers would collect those things, and then they would sell it. So if you muzzle, if you close off the, the mouth of the oxen, they won't eat as they go. That means that those farmers can collect more and sell more. So it's for their own greed that they would take the benefits of the ox and for themselves. Does that make sense so far? All right. So what happens if you don't muzzle the uh, uh, oxen or these animals? then as they're treading along, being tied, going around laboriously, very heavy toiling work over and over again, they get to eat and kind of get the fruits of their own labor. And they would go around and around and do this. And so they would eat. So it would actually be beneficial for the oxen as well as the farmer because they're both benefiting. What do we see about this? That we see that God is generous and kind, that he's the one that's, being pro he's the one that's providing for those who work for him. So a lot of us are like worried. I can never be a pastor. I will never be a pastor. They make no money. They have no possessions. They, do, I, I, they don't even have those nice shoes, you know? Like, I can't live that life of having the same phone for like four or five years. I can't, oh my goodness, what is that like? You know? God is good. Like there's, I, I've been, there are many days in my life uh, working for the Lord that I didn't get to eat. True. But I was never to the point of starving. Right? There was never a point where I didn't have a reliance on the Lord and say, like, God's not going to provide for me. There were times where I thought, like, oh, the bills aren't going to be paid. But the, every bill, I've never been late to a bill. God's always been gracious enough that I would be able to pay it off. The, I, this true story. Uh, my wife and I, we were... Like, we were struggling a bit. There were, actually, there were, we were struggling a lot. Um, our, our journey together in the faith has been really rocky. Uh, not our relationship, but relationship in the church and in the world. And uh, I remember, like, we didn't, this particular ministry that we were serving, we didn't have a car or anything. So we were walking back and forth from, like, the, 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 the far farmer's market and stuff. And I, w I was carrying, like, bags. Like, I don't know. <clears throat> you, you know when you want to go from the car to the house in one trip? You ever seen your dad take, like, 15 bags on his arms and then carry two boxes and, like, put one on his back and then, like, juggle one with his... You ever seen him, like, try to do too much at once? Yeah? I was doing that, but for, like, a mile, right? And coming home. And somebody at the church must have seen us. And... Uh, like a, a couple of days or I think it was like a week, uh, we found a, an envelope in our mailbox, 
We lived in this like old apartment building. And we opened it, it was unaddressed, it just had our name on it, and it didn't have anybody's name on it. And it was money to help us pay for our bills. And it was that exact amount that we needed to pay for the bill that was coming up. Like, how did they know? I don't know how they knew, but it was the exact amount. Later, we also find somebody who delivered food for us and left it on our doorstep because they saw us toiling away. There were times when we were waiting in line for food and stuff. Um, like, there are different organizations that give out free food sometimes, and so we would wait in line with the other people who are, like, in need, and we would share stories about how God's been faithful and good. And it's like a weird, like, brotherhood you, bond, like you bind when people in need are together. It's kind of an interesting thing. I, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. My family has never been, like, in the cold. We were, we've been just blessed that way, right? We were in need of, like, housing and stuff, but, like, it's always come through, right? When we first moved to Arizona, we actually stayed with uh, Pastor Charles's family for, like, a week because we didn't have any place to go. And, um, yeah, it was really, it was nice, though. Like, when, you, when you're in need and the Christian families just kind of step up, like, we never met these people. Like, I've never seen PC in my life. And here he is opening his house and his refrigerator to me, and I'm, like, just picking up frescas left and right, and, and I'm like, yeah, all right. And Sarah's like, hey, what do you guys want to do? And we're like, I don't know. And then they're like, like, we eat together. We never met these people. And here they are being more than generous and open to, uh, of their home. When we moved into our first apartment, and everything after that first week and a half or whatever with PC, we moved in. We had no furniture. We had one cooler, and Nana and ate, uh, we ate like Panda Express off that box with Abigail, right? We had, and, then, and then eventually we had small group over, and we played games on the floor. I don't know if you guys, anybody here? No. Oh, Joseph, were you there? We, remember when we didn't have any furniture? We played on that. It was fun. You know, we played games and stuff. They asked me some really embarrassing questions. And I was like, I just met y'all. I don't want to say these things. Uh, but look at, look at the way we are. We have this amazing new building, right? We have new equipment and things. God's just so good and so generous. That's not because I did something really well. I didn't pay for any of this, <laughs> you know? That double honor is coming from God because it is his grace. I don't regret the hard times. Like, I've, I, I can't tell you all the horror stories, but I've been through enough to tell you, like, your hard days aren't really that bad if you're with Christ. When Jesus is your Lord and Savior and your personal God, and you can go to him in prayer and petition and beg him, like, God, I'm having a hard time. I, I don't know if I'm struggling because of money, and I don't know if I'm struggling because of my relationships. If you go to him, he'll answer you with generosity and graciousness. He won't muzzle you. He won't re restrain you and hold you back from the joy that you can have. A lot of Christians and those who are curious about Christianity look to God as this God who is going to punish you every time muzzle you and hold you back and tie you up and give you hardships left and right. And that's not true. There's going to be hardships because the world's broken. There are sinners in the world. That's true. And we are all of them. So there's not going to be an easy road. But God's not the one who's going to be the one who, that's going to muzzle you and hold you back. That's the basic meaning of the muzzling and the work. So, there is something called ministerial depression. There are people who work in the church, pastors, elders, kwanzas, deacons, just people who volunteer, who get burnt out. The people who get stressed and frustrated to the point where they get depressed because they don't see the glory of God, and instead they see the work only. They just feel like they're going in circles every day. They don't see the point of what they're doing. And on top of that, when, when people start nitpicking and throw, shooting arrows at you, because you're an elder or you're a person of interest doing work and trying to do the work well, if you're on this pedestal and people look up at you, 
They'll try to bring you down. So the work is hard. I've heard some just outlandish, wild things from people judging me on just me. Not even on the sermon. Not even on my character. Just me. And I've heard uh, even older people doing this. There was an elder at a church I was serving, and I came up with this, like, what I thought was a really good plan to do mission work. And this elder, I went to the senior pastor and talked to him. He was like, that's good. Now run it through the mission department, and yeah, let's do it. So I went to the mission department, went to the elder that was not this church, different church. And I went to him, and I was talking to the elder, and he was like, why didn't you come to me first? You can't do this. I, I will never let you do this mission program. And I was like, but I just went to the senior pastor, and he told me to come talk to you. He's like, why'd you go to him? And then he yelled at me. He just completely rebuked me for trying to do the right thing. He literally threw a dry erase marker at me. Yeah, and told me to get out. He yelled and yelled. He took the proposal I made and ripped it up in front of me. I said, how dare you go over my head? And I was like, whoa. I was really hurt by this. And I was thinking, like, man, church is a toxic place. This is an elder of the church. Why would he say these things? And I, I repented a lot. Like, maybe I shouldn't have gone to the senior pastor first. Maybe I should have gone to the elder first. So I called him up later. So I called a, a mentor of mine, and I was like, this elder yelled at me. And then I struck my thumb, and I was like, I was sad. And my mentor goes, well, suck it up. That's, that's life. <laughs> I was like, okay, what do I do? He's like, call him. Ask him for coffee. Excuse me? You want me to go to the person who yelled at me and threw a dry erase marker at me and ask him to buy me coffee? No, I don't think so. I think you got, I think you misunderstood the story. So I told him the story again. He's like, no, I got it. You need to suck it up. This is my mentor. So if you guys are wondering where I got my attitude to you guys, or this, is, this is how I was taught. <laughs> right? So I went to the elder. I sucked it up, and I called him up, and I was like, um, so I think there was a misunderstanding, and um, if you could, can we get some, um, uh, whenever you're free, and it was such an awkward conversation, and he said no. <laughs> I was like, come on, man, I, I just, that's an all, I tried. And so a lot of Christians see these kind of stories and be like, see, I knew it. Look at that church. Ah, that's Christians. They're, they're devious and evil. They'll throw dry erase markers at you. Ah, these villainous church people. I don't know what was going on in his life, right? I, I, maybe, maybe I was right, maybe I was wrong. What saddened me the most was that the mission wasn't done. It was a mission trip to Myanmar, uh, Burma, Myanmar, and we were going to build bamboo homes. I know it's perishable. It's not, like, long-lasting because they have so many storms. But with a, just a few amount of money, we can build lots of homes for people who need it. And I really wanted to do that at the time because we were so close. It was in Korea. But maybe it wasn't the time, and God closed that door, and I needed to understand maybe I should have prayed more. Maybe I should have done this. It kind of humbles you in a way. And then I hear a story about our church here. There's an elder that retired, and he went through some hardships recently, uh, physically. And there's an elder that's retired, but when this church, when it's in its baby form, in its infancy, the church was struggling, couldn't pay for the rent of the building, not like this, way back when, before we were even here, apparently. And this elder not at the time not retired right at the time he says no we need to keep the church open so he put his house on a second mortgage that means he has to pay double for his house right so he puts another lien a mortgage on his house and takes that money and pays for the church his rent for the building itself and i hear stories like this and i'm like that's the elder I want to learn under. Let me go talk to him. Maybe he'll buy me some coffee. You know what I'm saying? That's the kind of elder of a church that you know is a healthy church. This same elder, same elder, I saw him in this past week. Uh, I saw him in morning prayer, right? 
not to say who does come out and who doesn't come out. I know he comes out. He comes out almost every, every morning. So I was, two stories, okay? One time I was preaching, and I came up, and I was singing this hymn. And the elder goes, no, 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 no. We don't know that song. <laughs> In the middle of the song that I was singing poorly. And, and I was like, dude, my, my, I, I already don't sing well. I'm singing Korean. And it's just like a debacle. It's just all messed up. And now he tells me the congregation don't want to sing that song. And I'm like, okay. And then he goes, we'll sing the next one. And I go, okay. <laughs> and we sang the next song. And it was beautiful. The same elder, all right? Okay, the same, same elder. This past week, a pastor wasn't able to come and preach in the morning. Something happened. And here I am, a full-time pastor, in the back. I was doing the media stuff. And I was like, where's the pastor? Oh, man, that means I have to go preach. But I'm in, like, my sweatshirt and jeans and, like, flip-flops. Like, I'm not ready to preach physically, right? Let alone mentally because I didn't prepare the message. So I'm reading the message. At, it starts at 5.30. You know, 5.30 in the morning. That's an a.m. That's, there is a time before you wake up, right? And I'm there. I'm there at, like, 5. And I'm waiting. 5.25 comes around, and no one's there. 529 comes around, no one's there. 530, and absolutely only the people who are here to worship, people who come to the morning prayer to pray and are hungry for the word, they're there to be fed. And here I am, skimming through the Bible, trying to get a sermon ready in my mind. Do I go up and how do I do this? I didn't pick a song. All this self-doubt and worry and anxiousness. The elder, after 10 minutes, gets up, comes, he sits always in the front comes all the way to the media station. He looks at me. He goes, turn on. Why aren't the lights on? I said, oh, the elder, uh, the, the pastor, the teaching pastor, teaching elder, who's supposed to be here, isn't here yet. And he goes, okay, turn the lights on. And I was like, oh, he wants me to go up. I know it. He's going to throw a dry erase marker at me. I know this. I turn the light on. He goes straight up to the podium. He's not dressed. He's not prepared. He didn't have this Bible read uh, and prepared uh, 20, 40 hours to, for the sermon and all this. He just knows that the people need to be fed. So he sings two songs. Just from his, like, open the hymn book. He reads the Bible together with the people. He didn't even have his reading glasses. He says he has a hard time. So everybody read along. The church joined. And then he says, let's pray. And he prayed for the whole congregation. That prayer was longer than the two songs <laughs> and longer than the Bible that he read. I turned off the light, and we all prayed. I was so convicted. I was so rebuked. I was supposed to be up, you know? But then I was so blessed because I understood that's Christian maturity. That's an elder worthy of double honor. That is an elder who is willing and able to lay down everything, his own house, his own reputation, what he looks like, everything for the glory of God because of the grace that was poured upon him. And I realized, oh, I'm not there yet. I need to go a little bit. I need to mature more. I need to pray more. I need to be ready. That should be me. And it will be me next right? So the Christian maturity that we're talking about here isn't just being mentored down. You get to the age and appropriate spiritual level where you can say and look and measure yourself. Not being measured by other people, but measured by yourself, by the word. Not like self-goodness. I'm talking about biblical understanding. That's the difference between a spiritually mature person who should rule and oversee and a person who is yet ready. When we're young, we want to be fed, and that's good. Right here, you guys are all being taught. You'll get to a spiritual level where you can oversee others. How do we do this? At your age and at your level, right, when everybody was there, 
same. I was there when you guys, actually, you guys are probably higher level than when I was your age. We need to humble ourselves to be able to learn. Then, once we learn from those who are wiser, more spiritual than us, then we're able to then get to a place where we can see for ourselves and measure our own spiritual wellness. So if you are not there, if you are not at a spiritual place where you can say, oh, I need, I know what to do. I know how to make myself better uh, for the Lord. I know how to make this church better. Then you need somebody to help you and oversee you. And that's a good, humble place. That's a good thing to learn. This is so that we work better. There are other stories, like, about pastors and and things. Churches feel like they need to withhold pastors' pay, right? They feel like, oh, we don't want want our pastor to struggle with money. We don't don't want money to be an idol in his life, so we're going to withhold that blessing. Oh, we don't want that pastor to have too many blessings because we want him to lean on God only, so we're not going to bless him, right? We have this mentality. Don't, don't do that. Don't muzzle the ox. Give the payment to the uh, pastors that need it. Right? Look for the needs of the pastor. So you may be thinking, well, what does PD need? Does he want something? I bet he wants something. No, I don't want, I don't want anything. That's not what this is about. It's about your maturity in Christ to be able to see the needs of those around you. And if I'm standing up front and if I'm at the pedestal that God put me on and you can see my needs, that's good. That's the beginning. But really, what it's trying to teach us is can you see the needs of those around you? Look at the brother and sister next to you. Look at, look around. Some of them are sleeping, so shake them up, right? Look at these people. There's some of us who need some help, (laughs) right? The question is, what can I do to help them? Not so much, I wonder how this person's going to help me. This is why judging others is dangerous. When we look, we're not trying to judge like what they're missing so much as how I can help what's, and, and fill what God's calling me to do. And I'm telling you, the first thing to do isn't to take out your wallet. Not that you guys have money anyway, <laughs> but the point isn't that, right? And so it isn't about what you can give. The first point is to pray. Really, the first thing to do is to pray. The question is, the person next to you, you can't offer them anything. How much money do you have, really, honestly? Not much. Some of you more than others. Some of you guys are doing pretty well. Your allowances are pretty good. And it's not about what you can offer in terms of money. Really, it's like, is your heart ready to pray for that person? And that's the real question for today. Are you guys ready to be an elder of this church? One day, God's going to call you. And you can say, no, no, not for me. Or you can live a life of such holiness and purity, such respect and glory to God, that when he calls upon you, you'll humbly accept and say, yes, I'll give my whole life to this and this alone. And that deserves double honor. Amen? We only covered the first half of this, and that's okay. Please, please take a look at this passage and read it for yourself, okay? Don't only take my word for it. So let's pray together. Here are some questions. Here's some questions to consider.
Lord, Heavenly Father, when we look at passages like this, it sometimes it makes us uh, take a step back and we think, it's not for me. I don't really have anything to learn from this. But it is your word and it is your perfect word that is holy and good, that brings restoration and reformation and, and just it brings life, Lord. So when we look at a passage like this and we look at the life and the experience of others and we see the, the work that you've done, that you are gracious and generous and kind to those uh, that you love and you love in such a way that you would give your one and only son, that we would be in the presence of you, Lord. And in the presence of you, we come before you in all humility saying, well, we're not there yet, Lord. We need people who are wiser and more mature in faith and in Christ to help us and guide us. So when those people arise and take the mantle, Lord, uh, help us not to judge them and knock them down and stone them but in, or shoot arrows at them. But instead, Lord, let, let us help each other give double honor so that you will be honored because it is your word, because it is our Lord Jesus, it is our King that we are honoring. There are things in our lives that we hold back and we prevent, uh, we prevent ourselves from getting closer. And sometimes we're, we're not honest with ourselves, with the sin in our lives. And so we have a hard time with this. Help us to see with grace-filled eyes to the needs of the church, the needs of the people around us, the need of the community and the world. And humble us into prayer. Humble us into doing more than just good works. Help us to take action and, and move forward, Lord. So enrich our prayer life. Enrich our grace-filled eyes so that we may see your glory all the more. Help us to see those who serve your kingdom with double honor. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us this time. Uh, forgive me, Lord, so, because we didn't get to finish everything. Um, but convict us in your word so that it will be about you all the more. Help us to see you in the presence of you. Help us understand the glory and the royalty of our Lord Jesus. Thank you for this opportunity, and we pray this in Jesus' name. It is our time of offering. Again, this isn't, it's kind of, this money doesn't come to me, right? So it's not about you giving me anything, so please don't do that. If you are new or visiting, if, just let the basket pass you by. We're not here to collect anything. So check us out. We, we preach a certain way. Do we live this way? And if we do, then join us. Be a part of our a member, our family, and let's grow together. And if you see that we're not, then convict us. Tell us, hey, oh, well, you said this, but you guys aren't doing that. Right? And then we'll grow together. Um, and also, uh, as we sing this song, uh, let's do it with a prayerful heart. So if you're willing and able, please join us. Rise.
Let us pray together. Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give back what is already yours. Uh, for all things are made with your beautiful hands. Nail pierced, sacrificial hands. And we try to live a life that is a shadow of that, but we try to live according to that. So teach us, Lord, how to be generous and kind and gracious like you. We thank you for the opportunity to give back with uh, our talents, our gifts, our, our resources, whatever it might be. Even in prayer, Lord, we are grateful that we are able to give back during this time. And may all that we give be used for your glory, a double honor to you, um, that it will glorify and, and build up your church and your people in such a way that we may be um, more useful, more of a vessel for you to be made in the likeness of our Lord for the transformation of the world. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Now receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his contents upon you and give you peace. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, please be seated. Quick announcements. All right. Announcements. Yes. So this coming, well, we just had a seminar on dating. Uh, if, you were, if you were unable to make it, uh, you can ask. We have the extra slides, I think, it's still in the back. We can forward it to you. Um, if you missed it, you can also obviously talk to Joe at any time. Uh, any of the staff that were here, they'll be able to help you. Um, next, uh, this coming Friday is our last Friday of the month, which is our big event month. And so we're going to split up. This month we're doing a whole middle school and high school, so separate, just focusing on each of you guys in, in that way. So for high schoolers, we're going to go and do like a potluck, cookout, volleyball, just the park enjoy your time, uh, eat all that you want to eat. Middle schoolers are going to be, uh, I heard you guys didn't want to go bowl, so what we're going to do instead is have games at church with food. So come to church like normal for you guys. Um, yeah. Okay. And then we do, uh, no one signed up for QT, so I, I'm, I don't know. I, yeah, forcing people generally doesn't work out well. So let's, uh, yeah, we're going to do that. Bible reading, I believe it's still going on, right? Right? Yes? Yeah. I hope you guys are keeping up with that. Uh, I am not keeping with this plan, so I don't know where you guys are supposed to be. I have a different plan that I, I go through. Anyhow, any questions regarding announcements and thoughts? Yes, sir. I'm just going to give you a minute. Just give you a second. Okay. Any other questions? No? We have a special announcement from Sam. Come on up, Sam. Oh, some of you know, huh? Yeah. Hi guys, most of you guys already heard this from Friday, but today is my last day of youth group. I'm uh, obviously going to be still in movement, like literally 20 steps away, so if you guys need anything, just come get me, ask me questions about dating or whatever. I'll more than likely say no, but anyway. Uh, yeah, I've been here for five-ish years, ever since Dilem and Joseph's class was seventh and eighth graders, just like you guys. I've seen them grow up, I've seen them struggle, I've seen them be immature, and then I've seen them mature as well. So thank you guys, it was such a humbling experience, it was a great five years. I can't wait to see you guys grow up and have you guys join movement very soon for some of you guys. Uh, but yeah, thank you, I love you all. Uh, yeah. 
Oh, wait, wait. Yeah, so we're going to pray for Sam. Uh, one of the prayer topics uh, that I know of is he's getting married soon. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll pray for that. Uh, so we're going to pray, and this isn't a goodbye so much as, like, you know, we're sending him. So, yeah, let's pray together. Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you for our mentor and leader and teacher, our fellow co-worker and brother, Sam. I pray that you'll be with him. Uh, help him, Lord, in pursuing after you with all his heart, with all his strength. Help him to be a uh, faithful and pure and honest uh, husband as he gets ready for marriage. We also ask that you will grant him your wisdom and understanding as he pursues um, your ministry in other venues. Uh, bless the church that he goes. Uh, bless his feet, Lord. Help him uh, to take uh, what he's learned and all the blessings from us so that he may uh, be a better blessing, uh, a greater blessing upon those he meets. Uh, thank you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go to your small groups. You guys know where to go. Go meet your teacher and they'll move you.